Price is fixed at the king. Price is fixed at the king. If the marginal cost, when the marginal cost cuts the marginal revenue curve between point D and E, between point D and E, or even at point D and E. So if marginal cost curve cuts the marginal revenue curve between point D and E, or at point D and E, that means over this discontinuity, then there won't be any change in the price. If M marginal revenue curve, sorry, marginal cost curve cuts the marginal revenue curve between point D and E, or even at point D and E even if it is point D and point E, then price will be fixed at the king, at the king. That is called price rigidity. G D T. This is point B. This is point E. If marginal cost cuts the marginal revenue curve here, MC3, if marginal cost curve cuts marginal revenue curve somewhere here, above point D, above point D, then profit maximizing output level will be this much, Q3, and the price level is this much. They are also state they are they are also equilibrium prices and quantities. But price changes, price increases, price increases. If marginal cost and marginal revenue curves are intersecting here. When marginal cost uh, 4, MC4 cuts marginal revenue at this point, then Q will, uh, equilibrium output level will decrease and the price also will decrease. Price also will decrease. That is below point E below point E. So if marginal cost increases, if marginal cost increases above point D, above point D, there will be an increase in the price. If marginal cost increases above point D, 
above point D, there will be an increase in the price. If marginal cost decreases below point E, below point E, there will be a decrease in the price. There will be a decrease in the price. But between point D and E, between when point and D and E, if marginal cost lies between point D and E, there won't be any change in the price. Price will remain fixed. If marginal cost lies between point D and E, between point D and E, then the price will be fixed. Price will be fixed at the key. And that is called price sensitivity. The fixed price determines between point D and E. These are some extreme cases. So okay. this is an extremely high cost. Extremely high cost. This is an extremely lower cost. If cost increases extremely uh, to a higher level, then of course there is no option. Firm has to increase the price. If cost decreases to an extremely lower price, then of course they can decrease the price. So without extreme cases, if the price, if the marginal cost lies between D and E, then the price rigidity will be there. Price rigidity will be there. So that is about King Demand Curve. King Demand Curve explains the price rigidity of oligopoly firms. It explains price rigidity of oligopoly firms. The next model we discuss is about carbons. Before that, do you have any questions, issues, doubts regarding the king demand curve model? The next model is the cartel model. We are not going to graphically illustrate uh, the behavior of a cartel here. We will have only descriptive explanation on cartel. And the best example for a cartel is the OPEC, OPEC organization for oil exporting countries. A cartel is a group of firms that explicitly agree. Explicitly agree. There is a formal agreement. There is a formal agreement. They explicitly agree or they explicitly collude to coordinate their activities. And that kind of a group of firms is called a cartel. If a group of firms explicitly agree to coordinate their activities, that is called a cartel. Basically, they coordinate the price and also they coordinate uh, to divide the market share, to divide the market share. You cater to this market share, you cater to this market share, likewise, they will coordinate their market share as well. These firms may agree on how much each firm will sell and on a common price. Yes, of course, they will agree on a common price as well. By cooperating and behaving like a monopoly, that after creating a cartel, they, they will have a monopoly power. They will have a monopoly power. By coordinating the behavior like the monopoly, the members of a cartel collectively earn the monopoly profit, which is the maximum profit possible. So, rather than acting independently, rather than acting independently, if these firms can come to an agreement and act as one single entity and, and if, if they can act as a single entity then we will have then they will have a monopoly power then they will have a monopoly power when they are acting independently when they are functioning when they are operating independently they don't have that monopoly power but when they come together under an agreement, they will have monopoly power. 
So after creating a cartel, they will have a monopoly power and they will be able to set the monopoly price. They will be able to set the maximum price possible, that is the monopoly price. Monopoly price. And since they can charge the highest possible price, that is the monopoly price, they can earn the maximum possible profits as well, which is the monopoly profits. Monopoly profits. They can earn monopoly profits. So that is why they enter into cartel. Individual firms get into a cartel because they can say, the maximum price possible, which is the monopoly price, so that they can earn the maximum possible profits, which is monopoly profit. OPEC is an example. Even though there is an agreement, there is a formal agreement in a cartel, there are some reasons why cartel agreements fail? There are some reasons why cartel agreements fail. There are two main reasons for the failure of cartel agreements. One is cartel members can cheat. Cartel members can cheat. Cheating is one reason for the failure of cartels. Under the cartel agreement, under the cartel agreement, they set a unique price. They set a unique price. So every member sells their product at this price. There are a few number of firms under the cartel, in the cartel. If one firm cheats, on the agreement and charges a slightly lower price. If one firm charges a slightly lower price, this firm can attract the customer base from other firms as well. If one single firm cheats and charges a lower price than uh, the agreed price, than the agreed price, they can increase their sales. This firm can increase their sales. Because customers from other firms will go to them, will go to this firm, who charges a slightly lower price, who cheats on the agreement. Then what happens? These firms, the other firms will lose. Therefore, ultimately the cartel agreement will fail. Cartel agreement will fail. So cheating is one example. Each member of a cartel has an incentive to cheat on the cartel agreement because by lowering the price, by charging a lower price, they can increase their sales. If individual firms cheat on each other, then the cartel will fail. And the other reason for the failure of cartel is non-cartel members supply consumers with large quantities of goods. So this is the cartel who are getting to an agreement. These firms have getting to an agreement. There are other firms also. There are other firms also in the Oliver body, but they have not joined the card. They have not joined the card. Let's say there is two big firms, two big firms who have not entered into the cartel agreement. If these two firms can supply a significant portion of the total market demand, if these two firms can supply a significant portion of the total market demand, let's say this is the total market, and cartel, cartel firms cater this much, let's say uh, 30%, and the rest of the 70% is supplied by these two giant firms. In that case also, this cartel agreement will fail if non-cartel members, these two firms are non-cartel members non-cartel members. They are out of the cartel. They have not joined the cartel agreement. 
non-partial firms. If non-partial firms supply consumers with large quantities of goods, then partials may fail. Because, because since they are controlling a huge portion of the market, they can lower, they can lower the price. They can charge a lower price compared to them. Since they are operating at a huge scale, they may experience economies of scale. They may experience economies of scale so that their average cost will be very low. Since they are experiencing a low average cost, their prices also will be low. So these non cartel members, since they are of uh, smallest sizes, they are of smaller sizes, they won't be able to experience economies of scale. Economies of scale will not be with them. The average cost will be relatively higher so that they have to charge a higher prices. So these not cartel members will not be able to compete with these lower prices. Therefore, this cartel will fail. This cartel will fail. They won't be able to compete with non cartel members because non cartel members charge a lower price because of economies of scale. So these are the two reasons why cartels fail. Cheating by individual firms and competition coming from non cartel members. Competition coming from non cartel members. So let's say there is a cartel, there is a cartel and there is no uh, huge uh, non cartel members, only these are the giant firms in the industry, these are the largest firms in the industry, so they have get into a cartel. If, and in that case, cheating is the only reason. In that case, cheating is the only reason for the failure of the cartel. If there is no any uh, large non cartel member, Cheating is the only reason for the cartel to fail. So, cheating. This cartel will fail because of cheating, because when one single firm cheats on each other and charges a lower price, other firms will lose their customer base, so cartel will fail. So, to avoid cheating, to avoid cheating, uh, cartel members can take several actions, detection, Enforcement, government support, and barriers to entry. To avoid cartel members, to avoid cartel members violating violating the agreement, to stop uh, violation members violation of the agreement. Cartel agreement by the members of the cartel. We can, they can detect, they can enforce, they can get government support, or they can impose barriers to it. So let's see how detection can avoid such violations of cartel agreement. Violation of a cartel agreement means it's cheating. It's cheating. In the agreement, they can add the clause. In the agreement, members can add a clause that each member can observe or investigate others' behavior. If there is a, such a clause, then what happens? Other members have the right to observe or investigate any other firm's behavior. So if something happens, something happens, a cheat, cheating action happens, then other members can detect. Other members can detect. So detection is like that. 
if individual members have been given uh, the right to observe or investigate other firms behavior of the other firms then if a firm is cheating then other firms can detect it other firms can detect it so detection happens in that way by the agreement there is a right provided or right granted to each member to observe or to investigate uh, the behavior of others so because it is in, it is there in the agreement then uh, individual members can observe or investigate others behavior to to detect to detect whether any member is cheating on the price or cheating on the agreement enforcement is another way of uh, avoiding any cheat cheating action by the agreement by the agreement uh, let's say they can say that we will take we will take legal actions if someone is charging a lower price than uh, the agreed price they can add clauses they can add a clause in the agreement that they will take legal actions if someone is found if someone is caught with a lower price likewise legal actions also can be taken against uh, violation so that there won't be any motivation for the uh, cartel members to violate uh, agreement the agreement so enforcement is about the legal actions government support also can be taken to avoid uh, violations of the agreement sometimes government can support cartels in the united states getting into cartels is illegal in the united states getting into cartels is illegal but in other countries the law is not strong enough to avoid getting into cartels but in the united states it is completely prohibited to getting into cartels formally or informally but in other countries there is no such strong legal base legal uh, framework to avoid cartels therefore countries can the governments can sometimes support getting into cartels government can allow firms in oligopoly to create cartels to create cartels in that case the members can members can ask government members in the cartel can ask government to punish those who violate the agreement if if if, if government can allow if government support is there if government support is there uh, for oligopoly firms to create cartels then the oligopoly firms can get the support of the government to punish to legally punish uh, those who violate the agreement so government support is another way of avoiding any violations of the agreement by the members and the other one is barriers to entry we discussed several barriers by avoiding barriers by, by imposing barriers like we discussed before what happens only only a few number of firms will remain in the industry because of the barriers we discussed at the beginning of this session only a few number of firms will remain in the industry others will not be able to enter other firms will not be able to enter so since there is only a few number of firms in the industry it is easier to observe what others are doing it is easier to observe what others are doing so in that way also in that way also uh, the members can uh stop uh violations of the agreement by individual members since if if there is a many number of firms if there is many number of firms in the industry then it is less likely to observe who is cheating it is very difficult to observe who is cheating therefore
by imposing barriers by imposing barriers the members can the cartel members can restrict the industry to a limited number of firms so that each firm can observe others easily so that members there is less there is less motivation there is no motivation for the members to violate the agreement because they know that since there is a very num few number of uh, firms operating in the industry they can observe each other that is about barriers to entry so these are the four uh, types of actions that uh, monopol oligopolists can take uh, the cartel members can take to avoid any violation in the agreement but or a violation of the agreement that is about cartels we finish our poly marker structure as well questions tiny one to the third five 11 third The next session is on international trade. You want a break now? Okay, take a ten minute break.
Up to now, everything we discussed uh, belongs to microeconomics. We discussed microeconomics concepts up to now. And from this session onwards, we will discuss some concepts related to macroeconomics. Microeconomics is about the behavior of individual economic actors. Microeconomics is about the behavior of economic actors. So basically, we focus on the behavior of firms. We analyze the behavior of firms in, my, in previous sessions. So we talked about microeconomics. Now, in this session, from this session onwards, we are going to discuss about macroeconomic concepts. International trade, we discuss at the national level, at the aggregate level, or at the country level. Aggregate level, or country level, or national level. So these are the things that will be covered in this session. Uh, a basic introduction to international, international trade and uh, absolute versus comparative advantage, protectionism, free trade agreements, exchange rates, net exports. So what is international trade? International trade is the exchange of goods and services between countries. Sri Lanka exports, tea, to other countries, to Germany, to uh, United States, and also Sri Lanka imports dal, rice, uh, some garment items, mobile phones from countries like China, India. So exchange of goods happen across borders across borders or uh, between countries between or among countries exchange of goods and services exchange of goods and services across borders or as you can say exchange of goods and services between or among countries that is simply international trade. International trade is the exchange of goods and services between or among countries. So in other words, across borders. Borders means the, the geographical boundaries. Geographical boundaries of other countries. So Sri Lanka exports goods and services to other countries. Sri Lanka also imports goods and services from other countries. So there is a flow of goods and services. There is a flow of goods and services. That flow of goods and services is called uh, international trade. International trade happens in both goods and services. When it comes to goods, we, we export we import food items, we import and export clothes, we import and export spare parts, we import oil, we import uh, jewelry, we import wine, those are the goods. In terms of services, tourism is a trade of service, it's a trade of service. When tourists come to Sri Lanka, 
from let's say from uh, UK when tourists travel Sri Lanka travel Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka from UK it's an export it's an export it's a service export when Sri Lankans visit the United States it's a service import the service import so tourism is a part of international trade it's a part of uh, international trade and it's in the form of services in the form of services banking is also a uh, trade or exchange between or across countries so if i have a have a saving account in somewhere else in a different country then that bank service is an import is an import i being a sri lankan i myself being a sri lankan if i maintain a country if i maintain a bank account in a country like japan then the banking service provided by this japanese bank is a service import is a service import if a foreigner if a foreigner from the united kingdom maintains a bank in sri lanka then it's a service export it's a service export because the sri lankan bank exports their service to this foreigner likewise banking also can happen uh, in international trade banking service also can be exchanged in international trade consultation yes sometimes sri lankan government sri lankan government get, gets the service of some international agency some international uh, consultants so that is again a service import service import if a sri lankans by themselves provide consultation to foreign firms foreign government then it's a service export it's a service export transportation also happens air service if a sri lankan citizen gets the service of emirates get the service of emirates then it's a service import service import if a foreigner gets the service of sri lankan airlines if a foreigner gets the service of sri lankan airlines it's a service export a service export so likewise foreign uh, sorry international trade can happen in both forms goods and services in both forms international trade can happen in, in the form of goods it is more easier to understand goods are exchanged between them uh, uh, among countries that is easier to understand but exchange of services is little bit difficult to understand when a foreigner travels to sri lanka it's is it an import or export it's an export sri lanka provides the service to a foreigner therefore it's and export if sri lankan citizen visits another country it's a service import it's a service import so in that way you have to understand how the exchange of services happen so anyway international trade can happen in both forms goods and services international trade provides consumers with the opportunity to consume goods and services that are not available in their own country so sri lankan citizens Sri Lankan citizen can uh, consume automobile, can consume cars, van, and other vehicles because of international trade. If international trade is not there, Sri Lankan citizens won't be able to consume automobile. And also, Sri Lankan citizens can consume mobile phones because of international trade. In Sri Lanka, there is no firm producing mobile phones. They are only because of international trade. Sri Lankan citizens can consume mobile phones. So, because of international trade, uh, people in the country can consume goods and services which are not produced within the country. If trade of goods and services occurs, then there will be a flow of outflow, inflow, or outflow money. Yes, when Sri Lankan exporter exports spices to Germany. When Sri Lankan exporter 
export spices to Germany, then Germany importer, Germany importer will send money to Sri Lankan uh, exporter. There is a money inflow, there is a cash inflow, money inflow. If uh, Sri Lankan importer, let's say Sri Lankan vehicle importer imports uh, cars from Japan, then Sri Lankan importer has to send money to Japan, there is a cash outflow, there is a cash outflow. Likewise, with international trade, there is cash or money inflows and money outflows. So, export is goods and services produced in one country and sold to other countries. Import is goods and services consumed in one country but which have not been purchased from other countries. So, sending goods and services or uh, exchange, uh, yes, sending goods and services from one country to another, to a second country is Exports. Exports. Receiving goods and services from this country to this country is imports. Is imports. And the balance, trade balance is trade balance is export minus imports. Export minus imports is net exports. Also, we call it the trade balance. Trade balance. Trade balance is export minus import. Exports minus imports. Goods and services exports minus goods and services imports. That is the trade balance or net exports. So those are uh, when export is greater than import. When export is greater than import. What is the result? Net export will be positive or trade balance will be positive. In that case we say trade balance has a surplus. Trade balance has a surplus. When export is less than imports, when exports are less than imports, net exports or trade balance will be negative will be negative. In that case, we say that trade balance has a deficit. Trade balance has a deficit. Gains from trade. Countries engage in international trade because of the advantages they receive from international trade. Because of international trade, there will be mutual benefits between countries, country A and country B, if they are engaged in international trade, as a whole, as a whole, their consumption level will increase, their production level will increase. If two countries engage in international trade, as a whole, their production level of goods and services will increase, their consumption level also will increase. That's why countries engage in trade. Gains from international trade exist in, in, exist in terms of production and consumption. Because of international trade, both consumption and production will increase as a whole. The gain from international trade arises because specialization enables resources to be allocated to their most productive uses. Because of international trade, a country can specialize in the best uh, goods and services uh, that they can produce. A country can specialize in the goods and services that they can produce more productively, where the productivity is higher. And they can send the excess, they can send the excess, excess means the additional amount to other countries. So that is what happens in international trade. The gain from international trade arises because of specialization. A country can specialize in the best goods and services, in, in the goods and services, the goods and services which they can produce best, which can which they can produce most productively. 
more productively. And then they will have some excess. They will have some extra amount of goods and services after consumption. After consuming, after consuming, they will have some excess of goods and services. And that excess can be sent to other countries as exports. So that is what in international trade happens. There are two main theories that explain why nations trade. Why do people, why do nations engage in trade can be explained in relation to two theories or two principles. One is absolute advantage and the other one is comparative advantage. There are two reasons why, that there are two theories that explain why nations engage in trade. One is absolute advantage and the other one is comparative advantage. Comparative advantage is more superior. It gives more broader picture uh, why nations explain, why nations engage in international trade. Absolute advantage has some weaknesses. So we will learn what is a, a, a absolute advantage and uh, what is comparative advantage next. I think we are supposed to finish the session by 12. Now it's 12.10. The next session will be started at 12.30. Shall we start at 12.40? We will get a break uh, for 30 minutes. Okay. Now we will have the last session. Thank you.